Canada and China have negotiated an investment treaty widely known as FIPA, the Foreign Investment Promotion and Protection Agreement. It's a bilateral pact intended to, quote, protect and promote foreign investment through legally binding rights and obligations. It might seem that an agreement of this kind with China is a natural fit. China, after all, already has many investments in Canada. But many Canadians are nervous about the deal and worried about the consequences of further Chinese investment in our country. Our next guest says, fear not. Here's Stockwell Day, former Conservative Minister of International Trade, former Leader of the Opposition. <clears throat> I clear my throat and we welcome you to TVO, Mr. Day. Good to be with you, Steve. What is FIPA? Let's start there. It's an agreement that protects Canadians who want to do business in China. Now, it's also reciprocal, so that the same type of protections are there for people from China who want to invest in Canada. But I don't mind saying publicly, um, Canada's investment platform is a lot safer and more transparent than China's is. China is improving. Um, so, so I that's would why say, our people need the protection more, more exactly. so there than they need it here. No question about it. We, we made it reciprocal, right. but I think even China would say they're improving but they have ways to go. Uh, do we need one in China because things are still pretty touchy over there in terms of really putting the puck in the net for deals? That's partially true. Um, and and I'm, I do say with sincerity, things are improving at uh, virtually every level in China. Um, is it a perfect democracy? <laughs> Absolutely, it is not. It's not. It's yes. not. You know, they've still got issues and things to deal with and things that uh, we talk to them very, very frankly about. Um, but yeah, companies still wind up, you know, they sign a deal and then later on they find out they don't have a deal. Um, people who are, uh, you know, whether you're talking huge companies, oil and gas, uh, financial institutions, or I think of uh, um, a sister-in-law of mine who is in the candle making business and ordered a container of a certain type of high quality wax to obviously make candles. It came out that entire container was defective hmm. with rules in place in another country, let's say the U.S., there's ways you can follow up on that. There are ways you can bring people to account. There's still some difficulty with that dealing with China, though it's improving, but there's still difficulty. So an agreement like this goes a long way to protecting Canadians, but also to give it, and also to giving them ways to follow up arbitration, uh, ways to pursue people who they think have not lived up to their side of the agreement. Okay. Needless to say, there is not unanimity on what you just said. And you know Rick Mercer. You've probably done a lot of TV with Rick Mercer over the years. I've done TV with Rick. I, I even have a royalty for one show I did with him. <laughs> well, he did a rant about this not too long ago, and here's what he had to say about FIPA. Roll tape, please. It's not like we haven't done this before. Canada signed a free trade agreement with the United States in 1988, but it was debated in Parliament. Heck, there was an election on it. We all got to vote on it. And by the way, that trade agreement with the United States, our closest friend and ally, could be canceled by either party with six months' notice. This agreement with the Chinese, 15 years' notice. Apparently, they insisted on that. Look, I have no idea if this agreement is a good thing or a bad thing, but I know this. This fetish for secrecy has to stop. Want to comment? Well, Rick and I agree on some things and we disagree on some things. On the element of secrecy, anybody can go uh, on virtually any website. You can download this and read it. You don't have to be a lawyer. It's, some of the language is, is boring, quite honestly. But uh, the entire agreement is there for people to read through. It's not that long a read. There are explanatory notes that go with it. And, uh, but Steve, you're, you're very right. There is not unanimity of opinion from Canadians. And, uh, maybe I'll take this opportunity to appeal to the hundreds, maybe thousands, who have sent emails to me. Um, you know, uh, uh, from these are Canadians who are very, very upset with with the agreement. I'd like to ask each one if they've read it. Um, and I'm I am no longer a federal cabinet minister, so I didn't actually sign the deal. I've I've worked on this in, in the past. We wanted to see this deal come into play to protect. Uh, Canadians. Rick mentioned on, on his, uh, you called it a rant, or, or it was called a rant. That's what he calls it, yeah, okay. a rant. He, he mentioned uh, the, the deal with the United States. That's a free trade agreement. This is not a free trade agreement. This well, is a protection agreement. We, uh, I don't know if we'll ever get a, a comprehensive free trade agreement with China. This is a protection agreement for Canadian business. Uh, we understand. So there's a distinction here between, say, NAFTA, a North American free trade agreement, and this protection agreement. They're Very not different. the same thing. The former was debated quite significantly, obviously, in the country, in Parliament, and so on. There hasn't been any debate, per se, 
on this one at all. And in fact, the Prime Minister went halfway around the world to sign it. Now, I know you're not a minister over there, and I'm not asking you to defend him, but for those who are concerned about the transparency around all this, mm. do they not have a point? There has to be 21 days in Parliament where this full agreement is, is before Parliament, and anybody can have at it, uh, say they like it, say they don't like it, propose amendments, which may or may not go through. Uh, but it, it gets a full look, uh, not only right now, because it's right out there in public, but it has to have 21 days in Parliament itself. And uh, I think it's going to get a, a thorough vetting. And I hope, uh, and I don't have a stake in this. Um, I'm not personally invested in China, though I'm over there a fair bit. And I'm not part of the government. Um, I was I said publicly, for instance, la uh, just, just recently, um, that I would have voted with the NDP on the generic drug bill. So, you know, I'm not bound by, uh, by voting commitments by the whip. And um, I, I want a good, prosperous future for my kids and my grandkids. But you this type of agreement will help that. Uh, he, Rick, in his rant, mentioned that uh, 15 years uh, before, you know, the free trade's cancelable on six months' notice by either side. This thing's apparently 15 years' notice. How come such a long lead time? I'll be honest with you, Steve. I don't know what he's referring to in terms of 15 years' notice because um, deals can be cancelled for a variety of reasons. And good lawyers, and there's been good lawyers on both sides, um, have pointed out that this is also subject to, th this deal is subject to rules adopted and drawn up by the United Nations as far back as about 1974. It's also drawn up along the guidelines that the World Trade Organization has uh, that was done in the 90s. So there are a number of other bodies who have proposed the rules for this type of agreement. And, and, and there, Canada has, I, I've lost track of the number of FIPA agreements that we have with other countries, uh, they are numerous. I'm going to guess 24. Uh, I, th I think okay, it's about a couple dozen. I think you're in the ballpark there. Okay, but if, you, uh, if this goes through and if agreements are signed between companies over there and companies over here, apparently you're in for 15 years. You're grandfather for 15 years. Even if this thing ends, you're good for 15 years. Uh, for the opponents no. of this, that feels like a long time to be grandfathered. Yeah, no business would sign a deal like that. When you go through it and you see what's available in terms of arbitration, uh, in terms of con contesting a part of the deal, um, taking somebody to account if you feel they have breached part of the agreement, um, there are all kinds of ways that you can put a stop to the um, contractual agreement that you have with another company just because of the way this is written. You're not, you're not tied in. Uh, to th remember, this is to allow business between companies mm -hmm. or between individuals or investors. And um, in terms of tying in for length of time, I, I, honestly, I'm not sure where he's getting at. Okay. Rick Mercer may not be the most small-c conservative guy out there, but Diane Francis is. And here's what she wrote in the Financial Post. She wrote, the most egregious aspect of this agreement is that it's based on the wrong template of deals signed with the U.S. and other countries that provide Canadians with reciprocal rule of law, market access, and transparency. China provides none of the reciprocal privileges and can remain as protectionist, corrupt, and discriminatory as it is now, as it now is. Opposition parties are screaming, but they always do about trade deals. By contrast, she writes, I am a free enterpriser, a free trader, a small C conservative, and an experienced business person, and believe this agreement represents a naive, shocking lapse in judgment. There is not a single gain for Canada here whatsoever. No market access, no reciprocity, zero rights for our investors there. China, Inc. gets everything. Okay, Re your reaction, please. Well, I disagree profoundly with what she's saying and how she's characterized it. Um, this is an arrangement that allows businesses, two businesses or two individuals or two groups, to sit down and sign and saying, look, if something happens and you feel we're not living up to our side of it, here, here's the recourse. Here is how it's laid out clearly in law. It, you know, I just was at the uh, China-Canada Annual Business Forum, China-Canada Business Council. Um, I'm on that council. Uh, the Governor General just spoke there, and the ambassador from China. It was pointed out to us by an international trade lawyer that on the World Bank grade, and this might shock some Canadians, of in, in terms of business dealing, in terms of uh, length of time to solve or resolve a dispute, how arbitration is handled and things like that, China ranks 15 there. I don't know, my people might think 15 is great, maybe not. Canada, as it was pointed out to us, ranks 57 in terms of length of time, in terms of uh, transparency. Now, I'm not saying I agree with that grade, 
but um, different people see these things differently. It's very clear. And the World Bank is making a certain evaluation based on transparency as of now. I think China still has a way to go. And well, to, when it comes to transparency. Okay, but that could be because we have rule of law here, and it takes a lot of time for these things to get resolved, and they don't have rule of law there, and somebody can snap their fingers, and there's your done deal. I mean, that's got to be part of it, no? Well, rule of law is emerging as a stronger and stronger force in, in China. They actually base, uh, strangely enough, people may not be aware of this, uh, they base, their, their basis of civil law comes from a German model, uh, going back over 100 years when they, when China sent some of their bureaucrats, I guess we would call them uh, mandarins, where the term comes from, uh, to spend time in Germany because they saw at that time the, uh, a country of stability and uh, stability of law. So they've got certain principles embedded there. Um, listen, China has a way to go. They are, I believe, they're moving in the right direction. We've seen over the last 10 years literally tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people moving from abject poverty into lower middle class and middle class status, and a lot of people becoming rich for the wrong reasons too. Um, but they're moving in the right direction. And this, as I said, an agreement like this, which allows businesses to have a higher degree of confidence that legal proceedings will be available to them, it, it allows them to move ahead um, with a little more ease than they had before. Well, let me pick up on that word businesses, because if you're doing business in China, you're doing business with the government, essentially, aren't you? In some cases, especially if you're dealing with uh, a so-called SOE, right. a state-owned enterprise. Right. And it, it's sort of interesting, because even among my conservative friends, they go, oh my goodness, a state-owned enterprise, we shouldn't countenance something like that. I go, hello, CN, Petrocan, CBC, uh, do you want me to go on? You know, it's kind mm -hmm. of the approach. So. Um, there are a few countries in the world, I don't even know if there's one, that doesn't have some kind of a state-financed business here or there. Uh, China has a lot of them. We're demanding of China that they live up to the rules that are laid out by the OECD that says you can be a state-owned enterprise, but if you, if you are, you have to live up to these criteria. That's a little bit of what's reflected in this agreement. Do environmentalists have to be concerned about this deal because they worry that the rights of a foreign-owned company could supersede local environmental regulations? Absolutely cannot happen. All, all rules, regulatory regime, uh, restrictions that are in either country, for instance in Canada, have to be respected and have to be abided by. Could this China-Canada FIPA make it more difficult for Canada to turn down damaging environmental projects such as the pipelines that are being discussed right now? Not at all. These are provincially determined, these are federally determined, depending whose jurisdiction, uh, Aboriginal involvement, all of that has to be fully respected. You can't come into another country, whether it's China coming into Canada or Canada going to another country, and say, our rules are going to prevail. You have to go with the rules of that country. Well, you, okay, you and I have read all the same stuff about this, and the criticisms out there are pretty legion. And if, if as you tell us, there's really nothing to worry about here, why are so many people apparently so suspicious of this agreement? For the same reason, Steve, many people were uh, rightly concerned about the Canada-U.S. trade agreement, which uh, most reasoned people, even if they were against it at the time, uh, talk about the huge benefits to Canada of that deal. I think uh, even Rick in his ranting reflection there was, was uh, giving a hint that it's actually worked out pretty positively. But there'll always be people on uh, either side of a particular issue. And, and you remember, I mean, election was fought uh, back in the late 80s on the free trade deal itself mm -hmm. and almost half of Canadians at the time were opposed to it. Just because the nature of any issue is going to mean there's going to be people on both sides. History has shown that that uh, trade deal has been hugely beneficial for Canada, for jobs, for people being able to plan for the future and I think they're going to see that with this but the fact that there are people against something doesn't mean it's not a good deal. It just means they're against it and they have the right to be. No, that's fair enough. But do you think so many people are concerned about this agreement because they think it plays into an already established narrative of the Harper government, which is too much secrecy, not enough transparency, we don't know enough about this, not enough public debate. Government would prefer to do things quietly, efficiently, but not necessarily democratically. That's the narrative. All I can say, Steve, is when you've got an agreement that's on the Internet, every item of it, every section and subsection, 
and it's been talked about, and it's basically the same, as, even as you said, a, it's like a couple dozen other ones that we have. So it's wide open, it's public, it's getting input. Uh, as you said, I'm not even a governor, I'm getting hundreds of emails on this. Why, why is that happening? I don't know, somebody, maybe because I used to be Minister of uh, International Trade, I'm, so, not, I'm not quite sure, but I'm, I'm telling my colleagues who are still there, hey, I'm deflecting all these to you here. But in a way, I don't mind that. But I, I can tell from reading through some of these emails, and uh, now a lot of them are, most of them are identical, they're word for word identical. That's fine, I, I understand how that works. I, I do wonder how many people have actually sat down and, and read it. I think a, a person who can read fairly well, you don't have to be even university level to read through this. Uh, you could read through that deal on a first time read in less than, I think probably less than 30 or 45 minutes. And then uh, maybe some people are waiting for the video to come out, I don't know. <laughs> um, but the language is there, it's, it's uh, pretty clear. There is some, you know, lawyers are involved, so there's some legalese, but it's uh, pretty good. And the business community, whether it's uh, small individual uh, business women, businessmen, uh, larger companies there in Canada, very pleased with this. They, it gives them an extra layer of security. 100%, 100% never. That makes it opponents even more skeptical. When we hear the whole business community is in favor of it, or when they hear, I should say, they get more skeptical. Well, I was just talking to somebody who's uh, doing some major work in terms of solar panels into China. Uh, their demand for this for vehicles and other things is hugely on the increase. And uh, they are very relieved to have this. It's going to protect their technology a little more than it's protected right now. And when they make their investments in China and provide jobs for Canadians, you know, back here at home, uh, they like this deal. So whether you're talking about environmental business or whether we're talking about cars or agriculture, pharmaceuticals, um, I haven't heard from the business community. And just because you say business doesn't mean bad. Of course. You know, businesses create jobs and people can plan their futures and raise their families and go to school because of jobs and because of a strong economy. And that's, that is reflected here. Let me ask you one last thing, and that is how much of the opposition, I'm not casting any aspersions anywhere here, I'm just mm. putting it out there. How much of the opposition to this agreement do you think is based in the fact that there are people in this, there are people everywhere who are very nervous about China these days? Um, a, a, a country they don't understand as much as perhaps they should and whose rise lately has been nothing short of astonishing, and that makes people nervous. Of course it does, and, and it should. People should look at everything with uh, a high degree of scrutiny. I'm still nervous about certain aspects of the uh, political situation in China. Um, I'm a little bit nervous about some of the aspects of the United States also. Uh, people should always have their guard up, and they should realize uh, some of uh, China's history is less than enviable. But in terms of overall progress, are they moving in the right direction? There's no question they are. But we should still go into these type of agreements, eyes wide open, carefully, and don't accept the view just because a politician says it, or a former politician. I tell people, look at it yourself, and see where it could be improved, and then call your MP and, and be specific. Say, look, this section here, I think it's faulty. Would you stand up and speak to this issue? That's what we're all about. Good place to end. Stockwood Lake, thanks so much for joining us here at TVO today. Thanks for your interest. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.